Yes. She was the She did. I haven't seen her. Oh, Yesterday, please don't. I, I'm sure. <laughs>
So um, there's that. Also, oh, my name is Dave, Dave Montoya. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at North State. And um, some of you, my wife, where's the song? There's the song. And this, where's Caleb and Becky? There's Becky. Caleb's outside. There's Caleb and Becky. Cool. Hey, uh, real quick before we move into things, uh, Sean mentioned it in the newsletter, but some of you have been asking about uh, small groups. Some of you have talked about hosting. Some of you have said, hey, I'm kind of feeling like, I mean, I know we've been through a season, not just COVID, but even the fire and stuff. I think people kind of went from hunker down to come out a little, and then COVID, hunker down. <laughs> and so, so more are starting to say, hey, I'd like to, to connect in a group. Um, and so what we wanted to help you do is find those others who are seeking to connect. So if that's you, if you're either interested in getting into a group, uh, or you want to host one, or lead one, or whatever, uh, please let one of us know, or before I just uh, mentioned, uh, talk to us, either an existing group or maybe start a new one or whatever. But we'll, we'll put that together depending on where you live and what you're looking for and that kind of thing. We'll try to help you walk through that, okay? So just let us know if you're interested in that. Uh, also, online, hi out there, um, we are celebrating communion this morning, so if you haven't already, you might uh, send somebody over into the kitchen to get communion elements. <laughs> Uh, later in the service, we'll be celebrating communion as a church family. Uh, and now, before we go into our time of uh, musical worship, um, just to kind of bring us into that and prepare our hearts, today's message is going to be about worry, about fear, about anxiety. That's where we are in Luke. Uh, Marcia will be sharing with us. And so for as we go into our time together for the whole morning, I um, wanted to ask you to just, if you need to close your eyes, close your eyes, just think about something that, um, maybe one thing that you right now are worried about, something that you're anxious about, um, something that you fear, and think of that. And then, as you're, as you're thinking of that, I'm going to read, um, sort of as a prayer, Psalm 27. And then we'll go into our, our time of, of worship together. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I will be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord, and that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to meditate and inquire in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, O Lord, your face I shall seek. We could ask the worship team to come on up. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we seek your face. This is the this is a gym, not a temple. And we are your people. Stones built into your temple. As we gather this morning to worship you, to hear from your word, and to celebrate what you did for us 2,000 years ago, Jesus, in dying for us, we pray that you would quiet our hearts, that you would teach us not to fear, 
that you would take away our anxieties and you would banish our worries. One thing we seek, and that is your face. Let us see your face this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
with these little fuzzy things on them to try to kind of dim the static. And he said, my fuzzy thing fell off and blew away. <laughs> and I said, Dave, I could riff on that for 15 minutes. <laughs> it still makes me laugh every time I think about it. His fuzzy thing fell off and blew away. Yeah, well, I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. <laughs> this morning, as Dave said, we're going to be looking at Luke 12, and specifically Jesus' teachings on worry, anxiety. Worry is a subject much like pride. Christians just don't like to acknowledge that we deal with it. We like to pretend we're above all that, that we've spiritually matured to the place where, well, worry isn't just a big issue in our lives. Yeah. We're kidding ourselves, and we're not being honest with the Lord. If word were not a real thing, Jesus wouldn't have wasted his very limited time in ministry in teaching us about it. He wanted us to take a clear-eyed, honest look at worry and about what, can, what God can help us do about it. Because we are not without tools. We are not without weapons of warfare when it comes to worry and anxiety. Let's look at Luke 12. We're going to just touch briefly on verses 6 and 7. We'll talk a bit about the parable of the fool, but we won't read all those. And then we're going to read verses 22 through 32. Are not five sparrows, in verse 6, sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Some of you it's a quicker count than others. <laughs> Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. And then we look at the parable of the rich fool. And Jesus said he had so much that he couldn't stuff any more into his barns and into his warehouses. So he said, I'll just tear those down and build bigger and better. And I've got so much that I can just take it ease for many years and I can eat, drink, and be merry. This man, now not a real man, this was a parable. We always want to differentiate between when Jesus is teaching a parable and when he's talking about real folks. They're standing on two feet in his presence. This parable, however, teaches us that this fellow believed. He honestly thought he didn't have a thing in the world to be worried about. 
He had it all handled. He had it all under control. He had no worries at all. And he was dead wrong. Sometimes those who think they don't have anything to be worried about ought to be worried. Because God said to him, fool, this night your very soul is required of you. Jesus was speaking largely to the crowd. We see in verse 1 that there was such a huge multitude at this particular instance, they, they were literally trampling one another or stepping on one another. And David has been teaching us about the difference between crowd and community, between those that the crowd was kind of fickle, but the disciples were really trying to learn to follow hard after Jesus. So in verse 22, we find that he turns and specifically says, then he, Jesus, said to his disciples. So now this is believers he's talking to. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider, that's kind of an important word, and Jesus only repeats himself when it's important. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Again, of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying about it, can add one cubit to your stature, or in modern language, can grow yourself one inch taller just by worrying about it? Well, can't be done. Futile. There Jesus is teaching us about the futility of worry. And if you are not able to do the smallest things, the least things, then why are you anxious for the rest? Again, Jesus says, consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. You just grow it, mow it, and throw it away. He says, if God takes care of even that, how much more will he clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink. And God isn't telling us there not to look after our basic needs. He's saying the phrase actually means do not set your heart upon do not set your heart on what you eat or what you drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things, but seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not fear, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure. You want to know what makes God happy? Giving you and me the kingdom. The disciples were worried. If they hadn't been worried, Jesus wouldn't have been talking to them about worry. And first he says to them, do not worry. <clears throat> and he gives them three reasons why they don't need to be worried. And let me just put it out there to begin with. Jesus was not condemning them for worry. He was admonishing them about the futility of worry, about its utter uselessness. But it was not a condemnatory thing. It was what we would call a teachable moment. And he says, you are worried. You're worried about things. And let me tell you, Jesus, that's why you don't need to be worried as believers, as disciples. First, you're far more valuable to Father God than anything you can possibly be worrying about. Secondly, worry is completely futile. It's not going to accomplish anything. And then finally, he tells them, and your Father knows that you need these things, and you can trust him to provide. So we're going to look at what worry is, what worry is not, and what you can do about it with God's help. So he starts out and he says, now, let's talk about the basics. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Doesn't get more basic than that. Food and clothes. Because he knew that's where they were. There was no use trotting out thermonuclear dynamics or Euclidean geometry. I mean, these folks were trying to figure out one plus one equal two. 
Be like telling a three-month-old to chow down on a double whopper. Their little digestive system just wasn't ready to process. And so Jesus says to them, let's start with the basics. Boogie you folks. Isn't it wonderful how God meets us where we are? He meets us at the point of our need. He does not wait for us to mature and progress and grow up in him till we get to a certain part where, point where he can teach us. No, he says, I'll just come to right where you are and we'll talk about these basics. They weren't ready to think about gifts or callings or spiritual responsibilities. They were worried. I had to call Dave or email him about the root word for worry because I couldn't find it in my Greek cross-reference thing. I told him, I said, Dave, I've looked in four translations, three concordances, two Bible dictionaries, and a partridge in a pear tree, and somewhere between worship and wormwood, or wormwood and worship, ought to be worry, and I can't find it anywhere. Fortunately, we've got a well-educated pastor, and he says, <clears throat> Marcia, the word is marinao, and the most literal translation is anxiety. Uh-huh. Well, I was getting plenty anxious before he calmed me down. <laughs> anxiety. When we look at Middle English, Old English, and Germanic roots of the word worry, we find things like distress, anxiety, cares of the world, to pluck at, to pick at, to push around, even to strangle. Boy, worry is an ugly thing. Peggy Noonan, a columnist for the Wall Street Journal recently wrote, something's up, and deep down, where the body meets the soul, we are fearful. We fear deep down, so deep that it hasn't even risen to the point of consciousness or articulation, that with all of our comforts and all of our amusements, all of our bells and whistles and toys, we wonder if what we really have is a first-class stater room on the Titanic. Everything is wonderful, but the world is ending, and we sense it. This is a secular viewpoint, and she's not far off the mark. There is what psychologists call a thing called free-floating anxiety. And I am telling you, the level of our societal dread today has risen to unprecedented proportions. But we believe that Jesus came to set us free from such bondage. Jesus prayed to the Father and said, Father, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but I do ask, Father, that you protect them from the evil that is in the world. In John, we do not have to be sucked into the miasma, the dread that something's terribly wrong and it's coming our way. You are of more value than the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, and your Father knows what you have need of. And furthermore, it is his good pleasure to give you those things. Jesus said, do not have an anxious mind. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a suggestion to me. Do not have an anxious mind. That's a pretty clear declarative sentence. So, then does it mean that if we're worried and we have an anxious mind, we're sinning? Some of us, a group of us, had a discussion about that a week or so ago. And here's where we came to. Well, it depends. That's clear, isn't it? <laughs> now, there are Christian traditions, such as the Amish, for instance, and I have great admiration for many of the Amish and the Quaker traditions and beliefs and their lifestyle choices. But the Amish have a strong belief that any worry at all sets the believer up in an adversarial position toward the will of God, and therefore any worry at all must, perforce, be sin. Respectfully, I disagree. Be angry and sin not. Anger can become sin, but it is not necessarily sin in and of itself. Depends on how much focus, how much energy, whether there's wrath and malice involved and a lot of other things. Be angry and sin not. 
money can be a good thing, and many good things can be done with it, but greed and covetousness will destroy our soul. Oh, now I know. So I'm ever thinking 1 Timothy 6.10, money's rude and all evil. Nah, that's not what it says. It says, for the love of money is a root of many kinds of evil. The world misquotes that all the time. But the fact is money can be used for many good things. Greed and covetousness can destroy us. And then we look at, and I temporarily lost my train of thought, but the fact is worry can involve legitimate concerns, and that is not sin. That is not sinful. Fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, some people choose worry, and I may, you may feel I've veered out of teaching and gone to meddling at this point, but hang with me here. Some people choose worry. Makes them feel, I don't know, valid or important or in the swim of whatever's going on. You say, no, 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 it's, it's not a choice. I just can't help it. I can't help it. Mm. Martin Luther, the great reformer, was once asked, how do you deal with unwanted thoughts coming into your mind and your heart? And Martin Luther replied, I cannot prevent the birds from flying over my head, but I can prevent them from building a nest in my hair. There is a point at which worry can become sin, and it does become a choice. Worry is not about doubt. Doubt is a different thing, and doubt is honest, and it is real, and it can be dealt with. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Worry is not the same thing as confusion. The Lord will help us work through the things that we are confused about. And it is not about appropriate concern. Worry robs us of God's promises. It dilutes our faith. It steals our joy. Wait a minute. Steals, kills, destroys. That's what worry does. Who does that sound like? For the enemy of your soul has come but for two. Steal, kill, and destroy. Worry is not from God. It is from the enemy of your soul. But faith and hope and trust, that is from the lover of your soul. Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith, not yesterday's faith, not tomorrow's faith, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith has substance. Worry is nothingness. It's intangible. It haunts your dreams. It steals your joy. It is a cloud of nothingness lurking underneath a covering of dread. Worry is futile. It is useless. And it doesn't help us any. Now, some people think, well, I'm not one of those that choose worry. No, not me. I'm always a glass half full kind of girl. I'm just optimistic. I've got a sanguine temperament. I don't worry. I'm glad she's not talking about me. And you smugly think, don't hate me because you hate me. You know? <laughs> no. No, we should not confuse our temperament, our natural born temperament, with whether or not <clears throat> we're choosing worry. Also, philosophically, when we say, well, you know, me, I just take the whatever will be, will be attitude. Que sera, sera. Say la vie. That's not the opposite of worry. Philosophically, that's called fatalism. More practically speaking, it can be ignorance of the situation. It can be indifference. It can be just our natural temperament. Neither is the opposite of worry, self-confidence. The fool was very confident. He had it all handled, had it all nailed down, had it all under control. He wasn't worried about a thing. And his self-confidence was absolutely, totally misplaced. Now, I'm not saying we should not have 
the self-confidence that God gives us, that can be a healthy thing. There's nothing healthy about taking the attitude towards serving the Lord. Well, I guess I'll just be a worm for Jesus. No, that's not what God wants for you. He wants you to be full of faith and hope and strength and grace and spiritual courage, but not self-confidence, not a confidence that is placed solely in your own skills, in your own knowledge, in your own ability. Neither is denial the opposite of worry. There are some people who think, well, just not going to think about it. I was tempted the other day to think a thought, but I thought it off. And they think denial will get them through the trials of life, but it will not. Faith and hope and trust will get us through because they are real, they are solid, they have substance. Worry is futile and it is without substance. Twice in the passage we read, Jesus said to them, consider. God is not looking for followers who are unthinking blockheads. He is not looking for those who value ignorance as some sort of a life choice. Jesus twice said to them, consider. It's okay to ponder things. It's okay to dialogue with God. God himself in Isaiah said, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. God is okay with you thinking things through and having some questions about what's going on in your life and about how it's impacting you and about how you're going to get through from one day to the next. God's okay with you having some real legitimate concerns when you don't know whether you're going to be able to put one foot in front of the other. God's good with that. And he's right there with you. Romans 4, 18 through 20 talks about Abraham. And I just love the NIV translation. This one happens to be a new King James Version. And it's simply because it's a large print. It was one I could find. And, you know, I'm getting to that point in my life where large print even with glasses help. So that's the new King James Version. But I often turn to either the message or the NIV. And in the NIV translation of Romans 4, 18, it says, this is going back to considering Without weakening his faith, Abraham faced the facts that his body was as good as dead because he was persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Faith faces the facts. Worry just cowers before them. Faith has substance. Faith faces the facts. Face it, faith is not the same thing as denial or just the same blind temperament. And Jesus is still saying to us, fear not, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Worry won't fix anything, change anything, improve anything, heal anything. Worry provides zero value. Jesus said, do not worry. Do not have an anxious mind. But we can have legitimate worries, legitimate concerns without slipping into sin. Let us not be confused about that. When I was a young girl, we used to sing an old song that said, Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hand. It is not, dear family of God, it is not today about what you are facing. It is about who is facing it with you. And Jesus is faithful to stand right with you and face your legitimate worries and your legitimate concerns, but he is also ready and willing to help you enlarge your faith and grow your trust so that you can move out from underneath that cloud of anxiety that seems to haunt your trail day after day. Some of you may be wondering, well, Marcia, that sounds all well and good, but do you really know anything about what you're talking about? In May 2012, I was standing in front of the admissions desk at Inlow Hospital. My son, my adult son, was laying on a gurney face down behind me because he had been bed fast for the prior nine months. He's a paraplegic and he's a school teacher, and he'd been teaching for about 10 years at that point. But he had had an abscess that had threatened his life. There had been an emergency surgery. There had been another uh, hospitalization for pneumonia and infection and cess 
sexist, that's a hard word to say, was threatened, and it had just been a rough nine months. And then to top it all off, he hears from the school district that says, if you cannot return to work by August, this was the middle of May, we will need to terminate your employment. He understood. They'd been using long-term substitutes. They couldn't keep the position open indefinitely. So it wasn't that we were angry or that we didn't understand the need for their decision, but it didn't help him facing, laying face down on a gurney. 10 years of teaching about to lose the whole thing. We finally found another specialist and another surgeon who was ready to try one more thing, but he told us flat out, this is our, <clears throat> this is our last shot. If this one doesn't work, we really have nothing else to offer. And by the way, if we can even do this surgery, it will take 12 weeks for you to recover enough that enough scar tissue can form that you can sit back up in your wheelchair and go back to teaching. So you need 12 months, 12 weeks to recover from this surgery. And by the way, his admin staff tells us on the way out of that consult that morning, it'll be several weeks before we can get you on the surgery schedule. We didn't have several weeks to get on the schedule. He needed to be back in the classroom in just a little over 12 weeks. But God is good. God is faithful. And yes, we were worried, but yes, we were also praying and exercising all the faith and trust we knew how to exercise. And on Friday afternoon that week at 3.30 in the afternoon, the phone rings and the surgeon's office is saying, we have an unexpected opening in the surgery schedule and if you'll be at Inlo at 8 a.m. Monday morning, we can do the surgery at 10 a.m. Thank you, Jesus. And then they ended up with them, please be sure and bring your preauthorization with you. Wait, what? Now, we've been dealing with the healthcare system for years. We knew the deal. We knew how the whole thing works. And we knew either the specialist's office, the primary care physician's office, the surgeon's office, or his case manager at the insurance company. Some one of those parties are supposed to obtain the preauthorization. Somebody dropped the ball. So they tried to just sort of slip it in under the very last one. And be sure you bring your pre-authorization with you, which they knew we did not have. And it was Friday afternoon, and by then it was nearly 4 p.m. We started calling the surgeon's office. Everybody gone for the weekend. Called the specialist's office. Everybody gone for the weekend. Well, we know how this thing works, remember? So we asked for their emergency backup. We called them. They were not available. So then we called the insurance company. Everybody's off for the weekend. We called his case manager, a wonderful lady, a nurse named Sharon, who had walked us through some very complex situations over these prior nine months while he'd been face down, not allowed to sit up for nine months. <clears throat> He was allowed to turn over for 20 minutes out of every 24 hours. And he bore it with such courage and patience, I cannot even tell you. But here we were, 48 hours away from a surgery desperately needed and no pre-authorization. So that weekend we prayed. Yes, we did some worrying, but we did more praying. And come Sunday night, we, we had faxed, we had phoned. Sometimes some minor functionary would say, well, send us pages such and such of his medical file, and I'll see what I can do. And we would fax him off, and then we would get nothing back. And so come Sunday night, by faith, he started the pre-surgery fast anyway, nothing by mouth, no food, no drink. We still didn't have pre-authorization, but he was preparing. And come Monday morning, about between six and seven o'clock, he says, Mom, should we even go down the end low? We don't have the pre-authorization. And then he said, out of his desperation, he said, if only we knew someone in authority to get this done. And I'm telling you, it was like somebody hit my heart with the defibrillation paddles. I thought Matthew 28, 18 says, for all authority, Jesus says, is given to me on earth and in heaven. I didn't say that to him. What I said to him was, son, we're going to call Merit Meditrans. He had to be transported on a gurney. He wasn't allowed to sit up. We're going to call Merit Meditrans. We're going down the Inflow, and we're going to keep going until someone says stop. So here I am standing at Inflow in front of the admissions desk, and the lady is not best pleased. She says to me, do you mean to tell me, Mrs. Young, that I have an OR book, a surgeon, surgical nurses, and an anesthesiology on standby, ready to do this surgery in less than two hours, 
and you don't have a preauthorization, talk about feeling humiliated and humbled and embarrassed. And all I could say was, ma'am, we've done all we know to do. We only got the call at 3.30 Friday afternoon. We've spent the whole weekend trying to obtain a preauthorization, and we're hoping that it will come through soon. Now, another nurse who had been listening to this back and forth exchange between me and the admissions clerk went off around a partition to another office, and about the time I said, we are hoping it will come through soon, she came stirring around the partition up to the registration desk, laid it on her desk, and said, it just came through. <laughs> Twelve weeks and five days later, he rolled back into his classroom. That was 10 years ago. He's been teaching there almost 20 years now. Now hear me carefully. Not every prayer is answered like that. There are times when our prayers seem to just bounce off the ceiling, right back on our heads. I am not saying that if we simply exercise faith and trust and hope, that everything will always come out lollipops and roses. You did hear the part where I said he teaches from a wheelchair for the last 20 years, did you not? There were plenty of prayers that went up over that many years ago. What I am saying is that Worry is futile. Jesus has clearly told us that worry is futile. Worry won't make a difference in what you're facing, in what you're dealing with. Faith and trust will. Trust in God will bring us from the spiritual sickness of anxiety in our souls to rest in the promises of God and in his tender provision for our needs. This phrase that Jesus uses, fear not, little flock, is one of the tenderest in the entire New Testament. I cannot find a, a place where it's repeated exactly like that. Fear not, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Reassurance and focus on the kingdom will see us through. God's grace will see us through. Jesus Christ, the Savior and lover of our soul, will see us through. Eugene Peterson in the message puts one of the verses that we read this morning in Luke 27 like this. Luke, Luke 12, 32. Steep yourself in God reality, God initiative, God provision. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Don't be afraid of missing out. You are my dearest friends. The Father wants to give you the very kingdom itself. Worry is from the enemy of your soul. Trust and reassurance in God's care and provision is from the lover of your soul. Fear not, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And now we're going to celebrate the kingdom together with communion. And Dave's coming to lead us in that. Amen. Thank you, Marcia. Wow. Thank you. We were, when we were back, we, we prayed together. Any of you were invited to get here at uh, 9.30. Uh, we have a prayer time before the service. Anybody's welcome to come. And we were back there, we finished praying, <coughs> and my mother-in-law, Kay, made the comment. She said, uh, she's listening to some things, and um, just shared the, I, I'm not going to quote her right, but she basically just said, it, it's all about focusing on Jesus. Like, just talk, we were just talking about this world and, and the cares and the worries and the weight and the, all that stuff. And she was just, you know, saying that, that if we get our eyes off of Jesus and onto those things, we, we, that's downhill from there. Um, it, and, and related to what Marsha is saying, it, it is. It, it, it made me think when my when Kay was saying that, I just pictured Peter on the water and how he, you know, gets out to walk on the water and he's doing fine until he takes his eyes off Jesus and starts looking at the wind and the waves around him. And then he sinks. It, um, we're gonna we're celebrating communion and really that's 
in a really true sense, that is what this is about. That, that Jesus left us with this, he left us with two uh, things, two ordinances, whatever word you want to use, baptism is one, um, communion is the other. Communion is something we partake in regularly. And what it does is it, it takes us and it focuses us on the most important thing. Jesus. And what he, not just Jesus. Because uh, Everett, actually, after my mother-in-law made that comment about focus on Jesus, if we get off on other stuff, we get distracted. And Everett said, and it's, again, I'm not going to quote him quite right either, but he made the point that and sometimes it's the things about Jesus that we get distracted by. We start arguing about, or we get off on all these Jesus-y things. But communion, the Lord's Supper, focuses us on the main thing. And that is that Jesus came to suffer and to die for us. Communion is a remembrance. And when you talk about worry, um, anxiety, anxiety and worry are about the future. It's when we think something's coming, like the way Marcia described it, some dread, there's a thing coming, you know, a train coming down the tracks. It's, it's, it's a fear of the future. We live in the present, but in order to stay at peace in the present and to be able to fight our fears of, what, of the future, we look back, we, we call to mind, we remember, um, what's true, what's ultimately true. And the reason we have this, one of the reasons we have this meal of remembrance is to ground ourselves in what is ultimately true. And this is how we receive the kingdom. It is your, fear not, little flock, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He gave us the kingdom by giving his life, by laying his life down for us. That is the way we, we are able to receive the kingdom. And it is his delight to give us the kingdom. I, I will talk more about this in the future as we keep going through Luke. Uh, but it just, I've been talking to various people and had some time with some of our younger, or 20-somethings the other day. And it just struck me the way they were sharing, even growing up in the church, how much, they, and as I think about it now and realize it's not just them, but people I counsel, Christians, disciples, struggle with really believing that they have received the kingdom, that it's theirs, that you are forgiven, you are his, and nobody can snatch you out of the Father's hands. He has given you the kingdom. He died. It is finished. It is done. It's not anything you do. He did it. And that's what this meal reminds us of. It is finished. Complete. We just receive it. We just receive it. So, the way we're going to do it this morning is uh, we've got two, two stations. We'll pull those little uh, covers off. Um, it's, again, we're you know, COVID friendly here, or not friendly, that's not, not a good phrase. Not, we hate COVID. <laughs> COVID, whatever the right word is, sensitive. Um, and so it's got the little cups um, with the juice and then crackers. And again, if you're with someone, you know, each package of crackers has two crackers, so you can share. You know, you, you don't need to take one, you can have one package for two people if you want. Uh, also, the little, there's a little plate in front of those two baskets that has gluten-free um, uh, bread. So, for those on this side, only. Yeah, just on that side. Um, so, here's what we're doing it, though. Very big, close attention here. Because uh, we haven't done this way for a little while. Come up, get the elements, get back to your seats, and just hold them. We're going we're gonna to partake together. And that way, too, also, it kind of, I think, if you're at home, um, you know, it's nice to be able to do this all at once together. So, um, are we, do we have, yeah, good. So we'll, while we have music, I want you to, again, contemplate what Jesus has done, but also, given what we just heard, uh, lay your fears, lay your worries, think again about what it is maybe that's 
troubling you, whether it's something very personal in your personal life, or it's the crazy in the world right now, <laughs> or something in between. There's plenty to be worried about, anxious about, fearful about. Uh, maybe take this time to lay that before the feet of Jesus and shift your focus onto him, what he has done for you. And, and, and if, if anything, just recite in your mind that last scripture. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So with that, and during the music, just come on up, get the elements, go back to your seats, and then I'll lead us together in communion. taken the cup and given thanks. This is interesting because he um, gave the cup. Wow. He talks about the cup first. He's taken the cup and given thanks. He said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Same thing. He talks about the cup before and he talks about the cup a second time afterwards, this, this cup of the kingdom. Then it says, and when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we take the bread together, do this in remembrance. He died for you. He brought the kingdom to you. This is his gift, his life. Let's eat together.
says, in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, and he said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And this is hearkening back to the Old Testament when the Old Covenant was made. Moses uttered the same words, uh, but he killed a, a lamb, a sheep. When the Old Covenant was, was established with the people of Israel, Jesus has taken this, and he said, I've made a new covenant with you in my blood. And blood means life. He gave his life so that we could have life. So let's drink together. You know, we sing our doxology together here in a second. It is a joy. I mean, the absence of worry, I appreciate your confession, Marcia. And I, I, we will say this, that when worry is banished, in its place comes peace. You know, which you trust, which brings peace and joy. And this, you know, not, uh, uh, the word, not, um, Apathy, or who cares? But just this, this, it's it's going to be all right. Our God is in control. He is the King is on the throne. We have nothing to worry about. Um, I hope this morning at least you've had a taste of that, and through this meal, reminded that it's all about Jesus. He did it. So let's sing our. Uh, Let's all of you together and go in peace after that. Hey.